Thanks, yes. The, uh, the trouble with having a last presentation of the day or thereabouts. Um, if you haven't come across CGI with the, uh, I think, the largest employer in South Wales, so uh, maybe some of our employees went back to work. Um, so I think we've heard very eloquently today uh, some of the arguments for thinking about cybersecurity in more serious terms. Um, and one of the things that I, I, I get, um, you know, I go to a lot of these things, uh, you get the scare where you get the um, bad stuff happens. Um, and I'm quite keen on changing the argument because uh, a lot of people I talk to, if they're in the management strata, it's a pity we couldn't quite work out the demographics of the audience, but if they're management, they're kind of stuck not knowing how to deal, how to think of cybersecurity. And if you go to some big organizations, you know, I've been to some banks and so on, where the guys at the top, the guys who are making the everyday decisions, have been there for 30, 40 years. And they don't understand that their business has been digitalized, that actually their channels to market are digital now, you know, that their uh, suppliers are digital and so on. And they don't know how to think about this. And when you talk to the tech guys who do understand it and want to do something about it, they don't know how to make the case to their management because the business case for cyber is really tough. It's essentially an insurance pitch. And so what I want to do is, is sort of put some, put that, some flesh onto that argument. So how we currently think about it, what do we worry about in cybersecurity? Well, we worry about uh, fear of losing sensitive data. We worry about uh, criminals, and ha criminals and hacktivists, as we had a very eloquent uh, uh, talk just earlier about that. Uh, disrupting our systems, bring the business to a grinding halt. And we worry about the embarrassment factor. We worry that we will be revealed to have lost data and that in so doing we'll, we'll be revealed to have not taken the right steps, that we didn't do the right things to protect our business. So in general, it's, it's about bad stuff will happen if you don't invest in cybersecurity. The problem with this is fear-led investments, which is what we're talking about, tend to minimize spend. The number of people I talk to now, they say, the board's got it, cyber's on the agenda, it's at the top level, but they're still not releasing the budget. They still not understand quite how much we have to invest to protect our business. So because it's a negative argument, it's still about minimizing spend. There's no positive business case for cybersecurity. If we spend more on cybersecurity, how's that going to benefit my business? Well, I can stop bad, no, no. How does it benefit my business? Because I'm the CEO, I want good things to happen to the business. There's no clear expression of benefits very often investment in cybersecurity. So you tend to lapse back into defensive justifications. Things related to standards and compliance, well, we've got to meet this because um, the FSA tell us to, um, or, you know, Sarbanes-Oxley, or whatever. Whatever compliance, PCI, DSS, and all the rest of it, yes, we've got to be compliant with those because we're operating in the industry. Okay, so we're compliant with those. Okay, well, that's fine. Job done. The other thing is it tends to mean that there is a lack of business champions because nobody likes to get behind these business cases, go to the chief exec, go to the board and say, boss, we need to triple our investment in cybersecurity. Well, why? Because of all of these negative arguments, because bad stuff's going to happen if we don't. Mm. I don't really want to put my career on those kind of arguments. I want to be the one that tells the boss that we're going to triple the size of the business and so on. So finding people to actually stand behind this can also be quite rare. And the poor old CIO who gets this job generally is always seen as a cost, uh, as a consumer of uh, money. And the trouble with all of these arguments, you only know when you spent too little in cybersecurity. So <clears throat> that's why generating investment for cyber is, is hard. So the question is, how can we turn that around into something that's a little more useful? So the thought process that I go through is, how should we think about it? And think about imagining a company that outperforms its competitors. 
every chief exec, every board likes that argument. What would be its key characteristics? Now, I just happen to play with some characteristics that I like using here. But I'm sure you can put your own business in the context. What are the things that would really excite the boss, the decision makers in the organization, the fund holders, to say, right, I'm going to get behind this? But standing back, if you, if you describe a high-performing organization, you say, OK, well, it's got a clear vision, a strategy. It knows where it's going. It's got great sales channels. It can reach its customers. It can attract and keep the best talent. Fundamental. It's got a great supply chain, global supply chain, very flexible. Um, it's got great market intelligence. Um, it's good at adopting new technologies. And it's got low overheads, fast, efficient overheads. Sounds like a great company, yeah? Be the kind of company you'd expect to have you know, growth records going like that, right? So those are the arguments. Now put that in the context of achieving each of those. How do you do that? Well, the strategy one, having a clear vision goal, uh, was explored a little earlier. If I want to know what's important to my business, or if I do know what's important, what, what's the thing that gives my business real competitive advantage? And I'm endlessly surprised how many organizations don't really know the answer to that. The really little tipping points that actually give them the edge over their competitors. Not we're the biggest or you know, we're the cheapest or something like that. It's very often something that's really quite subtle and quite often organizations don't understand what those points are. When you get hold of it, you suddenly find that's really important and, it, and with it tends to come uh, data. So let me give you an example. I was talking to a, a major, um, well, a, a, what's, the, what's the right phrase? A, a, a sort of high street name of software. So I was asking them, you know, the, the, what, what is your most valuable data? And I was thinking, well, you know, one assumes it would be their code base of their, their, their products that, uh, you know, they make billions from. And he said, no, it's not. It's, it's our bug list. So the bug list that, that, you know, the zero days that we were talking about earlier, that's the thing we keep top secret, that only a few guys have access to at any one time. Because if that got out, we would be absolutely torn apart by all the bad guys out there who would want to exploit. And it would take us weeks to go through the next patching cycle. So we guard that really, really carefully. So never mind the hundreds of millions of lines of code that underpin their various products. It's the bug list. I had another example of a, a pharmaceutical company. And naively, again, I was thinking, well, it's your, it's your new drug. You know, it's your new drug research. And they said, well, we do that on an international basis. We have labs in China, in South America. Um, you know, the, the kind of, we, we operate with universities around the world. So that kind of information we're used to sharing. The thing that really gives us competitive advantage is where we're about to deploy the next new drug and when. Now, the, the, you, you have to understand something about pharmaceuticals. It, it was that that gave them the competitive advantage. You know, and that was the thing that only five people knew. It was kept under lock and key and was only written on paper. So that was a really good understanding of where your business advantage comes from and a really good understanding of what data you have to protect. If you understand that, then you know how to protect it and why you should be protecting it. So it's sort of flipping the argument that says you want a company with clear vision and goals. They, want, they have a clear understanding where their competitive advantage comes from. And that's what you have to protect. So guess what? You need good security. That's one example. Um, other ones, and I'll go through these uh, a little more uh, speedily. So sales channels. You want to be able to reach your customers as reliably um, and you know, maintaining your reputation uh, as you can. If you have a sales channel that gets hacked and you lose your customer details, people stop trusting it. People don't use it. Although it does kind of depend what company you are, what kind of company you are. I was endlessly surprised by the, uh, the TJ Maxx, TK Maxx over in the UK hack many years ago now, um, that it had so little impact on their business at the time, in spite of the fact that they lost you know, 
tens of thousands of customer credit card details, and the person eventually got arrested for it, got one of the heaviest jail sentences uh, ever handed down for this. So you, you want to have good sales channels. You want customers to have um, trust uh, in those sales channels, and you want them to be multi-channel. So you want to be able to use it on mobile. You want to have um, the ability to uh, do it on tablets and PCs and so on. It's got to be good, right? It's got to be secure. Otherwise, it collapses. So guess what? You need security underpinning that. Talent. Now, here's a, a slightly more oblique one. I want my company to have great talent, to attract great talent. So I want the best and brightest coming out of the best universities, the best uh, areas of uh, employment that I can get. And I'm going to bring them into my organization. Now, if I present them after they've just spent three years in university um, on Facebook, Twitter, um, Snapchat, and all the rest of it with their iPhones and their um, collaboration tools and you know, Wi-Fi in every spot, and suddenly I'm bringing them into a corporate environment that's locked down, you know, that's got Windows, goodness knows what, you know, uh, XP, let's say, for the sake of argument, not to get too, people, too many people excited. Um, a lockdown desktop, you know, green screen terminals, um, a corporate phone that's out of, you know, that, that's very secure, um, you know, I, I, <laughs> a certain Canadian company that's rather gone out of vogue. Um, suddenly, the kids that are coming into the, the uh, into the company are going to think, "What have I joined here? You know, is this really the cutting edge of uh, IT organisations of?" Uh, uh, business organizations. I want to go somewhere where I can use consumer-grade technology so that there's no difference to what I use at home and what I use um, in my company. I want to be able to collaborate with my friends. I want to be able to use social media because companies are getting into social selling. So why shouldn't I use that? I want to be able to collaborate with people in other companies. And if you don't facilitate that, then kind of what have I got myself into? So keeping talent like that. And guess what? If you really want to provide that, if you want to allow, bring your own device and all the rest of it, you've got to get security right. And so on. You know, if you, if you want a, a good supply chain, and we had an example earlier of uh, what, what goes wrong with uh, supply chains. So RSA was mentioned, uh, Target, the way into Target, the, uh, and the American retailer that lost, I think it was $240 million as a result of their hack. Um, that was done by a third party supplier. You want to be able to have an agile, global supply chain where you can switch on and off organizations to meet your uh, inventory needs to create new products quickly um, with agility. You know, you might want them to have access to your own internal IT, well, not, you want to have access to IT systems such as billing and inventory control and so on. So you need to enable security. You get that wrong, suddenly you're a clunky, organization that has a, you know, stodgy, overpriced, slow supply chain, and that just ripples through to the rest of your business. So you've got to get it right. Uh, market intelligence, that kind of speaks for itself. You want to be well informed about your markets. You say exporting into other parts of the world, you want to be able to protect the information that's of, often fairly subtle, got people um, who understand the markets well, uh, they won't be part of your corporate infrastructure. You may have hired agents. You may have hired, um, you know, market intelligence specialists. And if they're Gmailing is probably a bad example. It's 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 a lot better than some. But if they are using uh, open email to send you confidential information, do you really want that kind of information potentially um, available to your competitors? So again, you need to set up measures that allow people to do that. Efficient overheads. Sounds boring, doesn't it? But actually, a lot of companies are driving cost out of their business by adopting cloud technologies, um, outsourcing, and so on. So how do you trust them? How do you know that what they're doing is any good? How do you know that they are secure? I know a lot of people now, especially small businesses, that are switching to uh, Microsoft, Amazon, Google. You know, it's great. Cuts down the cost of uh, the IT provision for them. But they have no idea whether the service they're, pro they're procuring are secure. In many cases, they are, and certainly more secure than they would be if they used their own people. But they don't know how to ask the question. They don't know 
um, whether those, those companies are implementing security in a way that they really would be uh, happy to understand and be appropriate to their business. And finally, technology. Um, so you want to be able to add, adapt to new things. So you want to try out new things. Look what happens when you don't get it right. And although this isn't a hack, but think of the RBS debacle a couple of years ago when they had a major IT upgrade and they screwed it up. And suddenly it brings the business to a grinding halt for several days, costing them millions and millions of pounds, huge customer um, costs in terms of handling the calls from customers and so on. You know, very simple little mistake that they bitterly regretted. It's so easy to do. Now imagine that was done maliciously. So all of these areas, all of these things that you characterize as these are the kind of companies that you know, th these are the kind of behaviors that my company wants to exhibit because we want to be a fast-growing, a high-achieving company. All of those are underpinned by good security. And that's the flip of the argument we ought to be making, as explaining to the decision makers that if you want the company your boss thinks he wants, or she wants, you need to get security right. So, in all of the discussions, whether you're technical or managerial, um, I think there's, a, there's an onus on us to change the, the language of the discussion, to lose the fortress mentality. So when people start talking about, yeah, we've got security, we're safe. You know, the black and white argument, it's not true. There's no such thing as security. And we had, we had several, uh, several exponents of that earlier in the day. Um, except that compliance-driven security, so just because you tick the box, quite frankly, that's often the lowest common denominator. It's the minimum you have to do to get through, through whatever the compliance regime is. And it isn't necessarily appropriate to the risk you're carrying, the appetite for the risk that you have as a business, or the kind of threats that people who are interested in doing you harm. Prepare, plan, and rehearse. I find a really powerful way of getting people to think more carefully about security is to take them through um, a mock scenario. Uh, we, we run these with various, various companies that uh, uh, we do business with. You sit down with a board and some techs, and then you, say, and, and you, you role play it, essentially. Say, so, right, as of now, you've just lost email server in southern Mongolia or whatever. Um, you know, and you just explore it. You do it in stages. And the panic sets in and things that people thought they knew or responsibilities that they thought were assigned fall apart very rapidly. And unless you go through that rehearsal, people don't necessarily feel it and uh, understand it. So that's a really powerful thing. Another topic, and I'll throw this in, um, I haven't really got the time to talk about it, but that's cyber insurance. It's a big new thing in the insurance market. And big new things apparently don't come along very often in the insurance market, so it's got a lot of insurance companies exciting. What I think is powerful about cyber insurance is it changes the argument. It's got nothing to do with technology. It is a straight argument by you spend this much money and you'll get this much cover for these kind of events. And suddenly you're dealing with the chief financial officer, dealing with the chief operations officer or the CEO, and saying, how come we're spending $5 million on cyber insurance? Don't understand that. Or well, you say, well, it's not, it's not covered under your P&O anymore. It's not covered under your PI insurance anymore. And you need to, but, but you know, I'm spending $5 million. How much cover does that get me? Oh, I'll say $100 million. $100 million? Is that really what I need cover for? Suddenly, you're able to trade in numbers and risk and impact and explain what the cover of the insurance policy is. Um, and you know, the, the, the impact statements that that implies suddenly brings it to life. It's a completely different way, a different way of explaining the risks of cybersecurity, getting cybersecurity wrong. So that's quite good. So and above all, think about good security and how it can enable your business. Um, I'm not going to do a company pitch, but this is, this is the cyber wheel we use to explain our capabilities. The reason why I put it up is because I wanted to borrow something. I just, there are three areas, essentially, that we do and that I would countenance everyone to think about. And that's one is to get advice, to uh, understand the policy, the strategy, the risks that your organizations carry. 
Now, if you can't do it as an organization, then find someone who can. So find someone who can talk to you intelligently about the issues here. The second one, that the protect the business, is make sure that everything you build or you buy, the services you buy, you've asked some security questions. So if you're using cloud services, you've asked some questions. If you're building something of your own, that your architects, your designers are thinking about security as they go along. And if you don't know the questions to ask, then find somebody who does and ask those questions. And the final third is actually protecting the business. So something that is an overlay to that, um, that will act to uh, protect the, the whole enterprise, if you like. Um, and again, if you don't want to do it, for many organizations, it's not core business to run a, you know, a SOC or um, other more advanced teams. And so get another company, get an expert in who does that, give you that, uh, that cover. Uh, so you know, get some advice, make sure you build it securely, and independently monitor it. And that's so why I want to stop. So questions? Any questions? Any questions for, for Andrew? Please. Sorry. Andrew, you support your um, your actuarial argument with the uh, insurance companies last year in the register was reported that uh, quite a few uh, energy companies could not even get insurance because they didn't get place of security requirements. So the actuaries would not underwrite the risk. So there's, there's an interesting evolution in cyber insurance at the moment. Um, so your point was that there are some companies, for people who didn't hear it, there are some companies who actually can't get cyber insurance at the moment. They're seen as too, too risky. Um, if you look at the insurance market at the moment, the people who are providing cyber insurance, they're kind of split into two camps. There's those that are compiling the actuarial data and doing it in the traditional fashion, very scientifically, trying to get the data, and they're struggling because a lot of this data isn't available. Because anyone who will know, ever having to construct a business case, you know, and as a, as a purveyor of security solutions, it's really hard to say, well, in your company's size, case, risk, profile, we'd typically expect it to cost you this much. It's really hard to do that. And that actuarial data for insurance companies, they need that same kind of data to write their risk doesn't really exist, so they're busy building it up using things like um, you know, the breach law in the US, which is where the cyber insurance market has taken off. And then there's a whole bunch of insurance companies that are saying, hey, this is a new market. We need to dominate it while it's, while it's starting, while it's growing. And they're using much more crude measures of actually writing the risk. They're acquiring the companies, taking on the risk, and in some cases, paying out large amounts of money. In Target, for example, the $240 million that they lost, 90 million of that was paid by insurers. So it's still a heavy cost for the, uh, the company, but there was real uh, insurance payout there. Um, so the answer, you know, the direct answer to your question, um, I don't think we've yet seen insurance companies really start to discriminate with the, the, the premiums they demand and the risks they demand um, according to your preparedness. I think that's a, an element of sophistication which is only just starting to creep into the American markets, and they're about five years ahead of us. Notwithstanding, there are some companies that have said, you know, we want some insurance, and either the insurers are saying, you're too big, too unknown, too risky, too high profile, actually we're just not comfortable, or maybe they just haven't talked to the right insurance company who's prepared to take those risks. What really worry me at the moment is some of the reinsurers who are sort of not understanding how some of the risks are being taken on by the insurers. Um, but for me as a security provider, um, I think the exciting thing is in about four or five years, once this security insurance uh, matures, then insurers will start to demand, okay, well, if I'm going to insure you at these kind of premium rates, I expect you to put the following in place and you'll get all the usual sort of games on exclusions and inclusions and what's covered and what's not. And you're starting to see little elements of that. But what we're seeing at the moment is most of the insurers are just going from uh, very low premium to cover ratios, so that they are insuring a lot for a little, to those premiums are getting ratcheted up quite rapidly. And interestingly, lots of the companies aren't changing insurer. They're sticking with them. Because if they've ever made a claim, they know, what they're, they know now what they're paying for and they realize they've got to stick with it. And to me, that's a great catalyst for the whole security argument. That's, 
excuse me, that's actually part of the question I wanted to ask, um, except it's a little bit more layered than that again, I think, um, in two areas. One is a big problem in supply chains. Um, far too much for me to go into, but it also affects acquisitions in terms of the mm -hmm. supply chain as well, and that adds a layer of complexity. Yeah. Um, in addition as well, companies can take the view that insurance is an offset against putting in their own very good or better cybersecurity measures than they have in place. Um, but what worries me more, even than those two substantial issues, is the number of threat actors and the number of threats are growing at such a rate. And with the Internet of Things, it adds another layer of complexity as well. The lack of or the difficulties of governance in this space, both nationally, internationally, states are seen as both, both threats and targets and so on. Yeah. It's, um, I've said this to um, members of the cabinet office and so on, and other organizations. It, your response, not just you, I'm not, certainly not picking on you, enjoyed your presentation. Um, it sounds very good on paper. I worry about it in practice, and I think, like I said, that given the attack, vectors and the number of attack actors, it's, you're in a very difficult uh, position. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, you know, again, in the sort of the in insurance world, uh, nowhere are you asking an insurer to take on a risk. You know, if I was talking to an insurer who was saying um, buildings, fire insurance or something, it's equivalent to writing an insurance policy for protecting your building from burning down while there are riots going on the street and people are throwing petrol bombs around or people are minded you know, to randomly come and uh, destroy your house, you know, that that's the kind of environment you live in. So in, in a sense, it's hugely risky what they're doing, but it's also quite a catalyst. Sorry. I, just I, I can't hear you terribly well. Sorry. I, guess, so. I meant to add something as well. The risk tolerance um, and best and worst practice can be found not only within sectors, but within companies. And that, again, doesn't make life easy if you're trying to insure against a range of threats. Sorry, I'm not sure I've heard um, all of that. You can fight, there are, I mean, I've done work on this for the Welsh Assembly Government and someone else. Um, you can find examples of best and worst yeah. cybersecurity practice within companies, um, as well as between and within sectors. And that, again, doesn't help yeah. if you're trying to ensure and um, mitigate risk. No, that's entirely true. Um, you know, that, that uh, companies within a sector, and, and, and we see this, you know, I see it every day. You, you can go into one organization um, and, you know, I can go into three organizations, say, in, in a week, and they're all from exactly the same market sector. They're all competing each, with each other, but their security postures are completely different. You know, one might be a complete mess, one might be really well disciplined, well understood, you know, that there is very little consistency where you might at least ex expect a sectoral consistency. So what I've seen insurance companies responding to that is, is very sort of uh, very, very basic calculations where it's all about market share at the moment. You know, this is a, an exploding market for them and because they're so rare in the insurance sector, they are desperate to establish themselves as a brand uh, to become the market leader and taking on quite a lot of risk as a result. Um, we also do some work with some lawyers, which is quite interesting because, um, again, coming over from the US, we're working with some uh, lawyers who make a lot of, who do a lot of business writing insurance policies, making sure that the right insurance policy, your, the policy is correct, you know, and need, you know, what you need as a business, and also suing the insurance companies when they don't pay out. So there's a whole sort of ecosystem that comes with it, um, and that will happen, especially if we go to GDPR as, as uh, you know, if the European breach uh, response, uh, well, NISD and GDPR, if we start getting more onerous uh, breach response and uh, data protection in, the, in Europe. Any other questions?
Gosh, that's an interesting question. I, knew, I, I, I didn't want to start talking about insurance too much because actually you should have an insurance company here talking about it. Um, but you're right. Um, you know, in, and it comes back to the same point I was just making to the gentleman in front. You know, this is a very volatile threat environment um, where you are responding to very clever people trying to achieve their own purposes, whether it's harm or whatever. Um, changing on a day-by-day -day basis. You know, it's, it's volatility, it's skills high, it's, uh, it's changing. So what works today is no guarantee of what will work tomorrow. So part of the reason why there's an, an opportunity as insurance is simply because of that, because it's so volatile. So I want, as a business, I want to take some of that bis risk out of my business. And I want to lay it off to somebody else who will cover the costs of doing that, some of those things. Um, but at the same time, the insurance markets are going to have to want to make money, so they're going to want to respond uh, fluidly um, and agilely to whatever the latest types of risks, themes of risks are. So to the fortress point, I, I think the, the important point that I try to make to people is, is historically and um, you know, amongst decision makers who haven't grown up with sort of digital technologies, there is a tendency to think, well, we put these measures in place, I've given you $10 million this year to go and buy all this equipment, what do you mean we're not secure? What did I spend that money on? And you have to get them out of this, this mindset into a risk management mindset that says, it doesn't matter how much you spend, if enough people want to get into your organization with the right kind of skills and the right kind of motivations, they will. And so you need to be prepared for that. You need to understand. It, it's just like driving a car or crossing a road. You know, you don't expect, just because I'm walking across a zebra crossing, not to get run over. I might think it's unlikely, and I choose the zebra crossing rather than the open road for that, that reason. But I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't say, oi, you know, I shouldn't be run over. There, there is a small significant chance. And to push the parallel to extreme, you know, if somebody was driving down the road intent on murdering pedestrians, then, you know, um, that's the kind of environment you find yourself in. So you have to think about it differently. And so just thinking you put up walls and protected your organization is not enough. You have to take on the responsibility of the risk. Any other questions? All right. Thank you for that. Thank you, Andrew. That was very good.